So hello everyone. So thank you again for attending our Rick Rogers Efficient AI Seminar Talk. And today we are very glad we have Professor Shi Meng Yu from the Georgia Tech to give us this talk. Uh, Professor Yu is currently Associate Professor of the EC Department at Georgia Tech. He received his bachelor degree from the Peking University and the master and PhD from the Stanford. And uh, his research expertise is on the emerging non volatile memories for patients, such as the deep learning accelerator, in memory computing, 3D integration, and hardware security. And uh, Professor Yu uh, was a recipient of the NSF Career Award, IEEE Electron Device Society Early Career Award, ACM SIGDA Outstanding New Factory Award, SRC Young Factory Award, the DAC Under 40 Innovations Award. IEEE Circuits and System Society Distinguished Lecturer, and so on. And he served or is serving many premier conferences, technical, prog uh, technical program committee, including the IEDM, VSI Technology, IRPS, DAC, ICCAD, DATE, and so on. And he's currently a senior member of the IEEE. Okay, so now let's welcome Professor Yu to give us this talk. Thank you both for the nice introduction, and it's my great pleasure to be here to share some of our research progress in the area of the circuit design and physical implementations of the computing memory architectures for the deep learning inference engine design. So here we have a reference for this talk recently published in the IEEE Circuits and System Magazine. So most of the materials actually can be found in this article. So this is an outline of today's presentation. First, I will give a brief background uh, about the computing memory. And this is an emerging paradigm to accelerate the machine learning workloads. And then we will survey some of the recent computing memory prototypes that are implemented into the silicon. That means we have the prototype chips, first with the SRAM technology, and second with the RAM technology. And then I will discuss some general design challenges for the computing memory. And then finally, I will point out some future research trend that is to do the modernistic 3D integration and for the computing memory. First of all, I think the audience here are very familiar with the trend of the hardware acceleration for the AI, artificial intelligence workload. And I believe that GPU is still widely used and dominates the training workload, especially in the cloud. And we also see that FPGA is becoming popular for the inference, especially if we want to fast prototype in different algorithms. And also the research community and also industry start working on the digital ASIC design to specialize the hardware for the machine learning workload. So here one of the popular example is the Google's TPU tensor processing unit. And this relies on the digital circuit to do the systolic array for acceleration of the machine learning workloads. And if you look at those different platforms here, then we can quote the energy efficiency that is essentially the throughput divided by the power in terms of the tera operations per second, T ops per watt. So the GPU of the FPGA can reach up to like 0.1 TOPS per watt. And then the digital ASIC solutions like the TPU or the variants of the TPU can reach about like 1 to 10 TOPS per watt. Then if we want to further boost the energy efficiency, especially for the edge applications where the uh, power is constrained, then we want to further utilize some of the analog design techniques to perform this computing memory. So here we try to merge the computation into the memory array and use some of the analog computation techniques to further accelerate the compute load. So if we can do that, then the estimated energy efficiency can be up to like 100 T ops per watt. Of course, there are some challenges associated with this new computer pa paradigm. For example, the GPU generally can employ the floating point computation and it can reach high accuracy. And with some like the quantization method, then the fixed point computation 
and typically used in those digital ASIC solutions can also support high accuracy. But for the computing memory like an approach, then generally we have to lower the precision requirement. Then there may come with a question whether we can achieve the same accuracy as a digital solution. So we are going to address some of those issues later in the talk. But generally, the accuracy may be sacrificed in the analog approach because analog compute essentially uh, it suffer from the noise and variations. So if we can do this computing memory in the mixed signal or analog domain, then we can probably further improve the energy efficiency. This is especially important for the edge inference. And uh, we can also enable some transfer learning and with continuous name, possibly unlabeled data set as an edge. So for example, we can do some incremental learning or the transfer learning. So this is another application scenario for this computing memory uh, uh, accelerators. But the, the first target should be the inference. So here, this is a comparison between the digital accelerators like the PPU with the systolic array versus the computing memory accelerator. So in the digital accelerators, there are many PEs, processing elements made of the MAC units. MAC is the like multiplier and adder, and of course with register and control. And the data is stored in the shared s and global buffer in those kind of digital accelerator. And this includes both the weights and the activations. Uh, and then for the computing memory, then here the weights are typically stationary. The weights are stored in the memory array. So we only move the input and output act activations around the chip. Therefore, we can reduce the data movement in this computing memory design. And uh, 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 so the conventional like uh, digital accelerator, then when you access the memory from the shared s run global buffer, then typically it's row by row. So therefore, this is like a slow and inefficient. But in, for the computing memory design, when we do the computation here, then the multiple rows can be turned on simultaneously. So we can enable the parallel access and we can eliminate some of the Mac units at the edge of the array. Instead, we have to employ some of the ADC and of two digital converters. I will talk about more in the next. So here, this is a, a subarray for the computing memory macro. And here are the mem memory elements organized in the rows and columns. And of course, there are some peripheral circuits to support the addressing and uh, uh, the uh, analog to digital conversion. So here, the input vectors uh, from your input feature map can be loaded in as a voltage in parallel to turn on multiple rows. And then the weights are encoded as the conductance of the memory cell. So the voltage multiplied by the conductance will result in a current. And this current can be summed up naturally through the columns. So at the end of the column, the end of partial sum is represented as the current. And then we need to convert this current to the digital output through the peripheral circuits like the ADC. And then depending on the precision, we may have to do the shift and add because if the weight is like eight bit per uh, eight bit, but the memory cell is like a two bit per cell, then we need four cells to reconstruct the eight bit precision. So we may need some additional shift and add to uh, reconstruct the significance of the weights. But in terms of the memory technologies we can use for this uh, array, either like a six transistor S run or even eight transistor S run can be a good candidate because this is a mature uh, technology in the CMOS industry. And then if you want more like compact solution, then we can use this 1T1R structure, one transistor control a uh, programmable uh, resistor. And this resistor can encode the weight as well. So we will talk about the SRAM and the 1T1R based uh, r run implementations later in the presentation. So here then, let's first uh, talk about the SRAM implementation. So here, why SRAM for the computing memory? 
So first of all, the S line is a mature silicon CMOS technology that scales well with the logic process. So today we have five nanometer process available. And possibly the industry will introduce three nanometer very soon in one year or two. So large array capacity has been demonstrated for cache applications. For example, at seven nanometer load or five nanometer load, the industry has already demonstrated that 256 megabit uh, S run cache. So this is like a 32 megabyte uh, if it's eight bit precision. So 32 megabyte can hold some reasonably sized neural network model already. Um, if we want to use SRAM for the computing memory, we have to do some changes on the bit cell structure. So this is a conventional six transistor SRAM. We have a cross coupled notch in the middle and then we have two pass gates as a six transistor to interface the bit man with the storage node. And we can use this one for the computation. So here is uh, how we do that. Uh, assuming that we store the data like this, if Q stores zero, Q bus stores one, then this is like your weight, one bit weight. And then we can uh, input the feature map. If the input is uh, one, then this uh, word will turn on. And then in this configuration, so the bit line is pre-charged. So bit line will decay through the right access transistor, through the large current from the bit line to ground here. And then on the left hand side, and because we turn on multiple rows, bit line bar will also decay. And but in this case, the decay current, discharge current will be smaller uh, because the bit line is still mostly close to the VDD. So we have the difference in the discharge current on the left branch and right branch. So imagine that we have multiple rows of those uh, six transistor SRAN cell, then we can compare the discharge current from the left branch and right branch in total. Then we can get the partial sum as a summation of those discharge current from both bit line bar or bit line. And uh, of course here, then one of the challenges is the uh, waste of the uh, energy on the other side, because ideally we just need one, one side to do the computation. So what we can do here is to change the bit, bit cell structure to enable the uh, individual control of those Q and Q bar. So here we, are, we add additional like word line bar. So we split the word line into dual word line. And then in this case, uh, if we still have uh, inputs, then the input will be a Reform, uh, uh, reformulated to a complementary pattern. Let's say one control over line bar and zero control over line. Then in this case, if you look at this configuration, then the only current that will flow is from the bit line to the ground. So the other side will not be a discharge because this is controlled by the word line, which is zero in this case. So basically this implements the X law operation between the input and the weight. Uh, so this can enlarge the sense margin between the bit line and bit line bar because in this case only one side is discharging. And then here we have one challenge in this kind of 6T transistor design because when we turn on multiple rows, uh, the bit line and bit line bar will decay. If that decay into a very low voltage level, then the data stored in the storage node may be disturbed. That means the data may flip which is undesired. So we, what we want to do is to decouple the read and write path of the uh, SRAN cell. So what we can typically do is to add this read stack, become an 80 bit transistor uh, SRAN cell. So it's here we have additional like uh, two pass gate in series. So this function has the read path. And in this case, if you look at the, look at the configuration here, then if the Store data is zero. So here and this read path will be disabled. So there's no discharge current from the bit line, read bit line. But if the stored pattern is one, then here we will have the discharge current. So this storage node controls the gate of this transistor. Therefore, uh, it will not be disturbed. So this is uh, another improved design for the SRAM used for the computing memory. And also the SRAM can 
support the transpose computation. If you want to do the training, then we have to do the back propagation. That means the data flow will be reversed. So here in this case, we can add additional two transistors here to enable, for example, in this case, this is like the input is horizontal, output is vertical. And if we do the back propagation in the transpose way, then we can have the input vertical and the output horizontal through additional set of the cascade transistor. So there are many uh, possible variations of the S1 bit cell to enable different uh, uh, functionality for the compute. So with those ideas here, I just want to have a survey of the recent demonstrations into the silicon. So here, those are the prototype chips reported in the major conferences like the ISCC or the VOSI symposium. So here, they range from different technology nodes. And the early demonstrations is like 130 nanometer and the recent demonstration, for example, this one from TSMC uses the latest like seven nanometer process. So here they have different bit cell structure. Some of them use 6P s cell, some of them use 8T s cell. And then here are different array size, different capacity, and uh, different uh, like precision of the input weight and output. So general trend is to support the multi-bit input, multi-bit output. And some of them uh, demonstrated the algorithms that is a convolutional neural network. And this is a reported energy efficiency. So here I have to uh, clarify that. So this efficiency is normalized to one bit by one bit MAC operation. This is because different implementations may use different precision. So we have to be fair to normalize everyone to be one bit by one bit. So if you do that, then the best is from this seven nanometer process, it's reaching at 5,000 TOPS per watt. Of course, this is uh, normalized to one bit by one bit. If normally we use like eight bit by eight bit, then this number will be divided by 64. Uh, by definition. So this one will be around like 80, close to 100 TOPS per watt. So then here are more like demonstrations from university groups. I will skip the details. Uh, you can refer to this table if you want to uh, dig into the particular design. And the next, I will just uh, highlight some of the designs that we uh, contributed to. So this is one design we work with the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan, Professor Meng Fan Chang's group. And uh, this is one of the earliest demonstration in the SRAN based on computing memory. So here we use a split 60 SRAN cell um, with a compact design rule from the foundry. And uh, here is a summary of the chip. It's uh, based on 65 nanometer. And uh, uh, here we have the demonstrating the MNIST. This is one of the earliest demonstrations. So it's a simple data set. And this is reporting the energy efficiency. Uh, I believe this is normalized to one bit by one bit as well. So this is a layout of the split uh, uh, SRAN cell. So we need additional the VLAN. So we have to we'll have additional VLAN to control the cascade. So here are some key features of the design. And uh, first of all, this implements the XNOR computation because if you split the uh, VLAN as we discussed earlier, then the bit cell essentially performs the XNOR computation. So naturally you can map this to the binary neural network, that's the XNOR net. And then here's another uh, uh, innovation is that for the word line, we have to lower the voltage, otherwise it will disturb the data. So here we try to lower down the word line voltage, therefore the bit and decay can be suppressed. And then the sensor design here use some offset cancellation skin to basically deal with the process variation. So I will skip the details of the circuit implementations. And then in the second year, uh, we uh, I collaborate again to improve the design. So in this case, uh, we use this uh, so-called twin ATS run cell. This is to improve the read disturb uh, feature. Because we realize if we turn on multiple rows, especially like a hundred uh, and like tens of rows simultaneously, then the S run is under the disturb mode. So we have to deal with that. So then this is a chip, and then I'll skip the details, but I just want to highlight some of the features. So this is a twin AT cell for 
example, here we have eight transistors for this uh, LSB, and then eight transistors for the MSB. So here is a two-bit weight. And uh, uh, here we can naturally sum up those two-bit weights uh, through the bit length by the current. So the way we do that is to size up the rate stack here, those two transistors, which is uh, which has which may have uh, wider transistor weights. So let's, let's say twice of the W over L than the LSB stack. Therefore, the current will be doubled from the MSB branch. So here, if we add up the current uh, naturally along the bit length, then the bit length current will represent the twice of the MSB plus the LSB. So the significance is reconstructed in this way. And there are some other design techniques to enable the dual channel processing of skip that. Uh, and then one other feature of this design is to handle the negative weight in the neural network. So one way to do that is to use a tooth complement code to have a sum bit, and then we can process the sum bit at the end of the colon. So basically we need to flip the uh, uh, priority of the bit and then add with the sum bit to reconstruct the significance uh, using the negative weight. And then this is a paper that we mentioned earlier by the TSMC. This is uh, one of the most advanced demonstrations today. This is on the seven nanometer process, but the basic design ideas is the same as the previous uh, paper that we collaborated with uh, NTHU. So this is again an AT uh, SRAM, really to decouple the SRAM, and then it's called multi bit. So here, one of the innovations by the TSM, TSMC folks is to have this analog shift and add uh, between the digital shift and add. So here the idea is that if we have four bit weights, uh, then we try to reconstruct the significance uh, before the ADC. So here what we can do is to have the stack array. So this is a capacitor capacitive array with different capacitance. So then here the current from the MSB will be sized up uh, in terms of the charges because here we have a larger cap. Then we can use this cap ratio like eight, four, two, one to reconstruct the significance of the weight. So then we can sum up the charges in the analog domain, and then the total charge will represent the partial sum from the four bit weight uh, computation results. So this is uh, the SRAM based design. So I would like to have a quick summary. So SRAM is a mature candidate because we can uh, use it almost advanced security load. And uh, the main disadvantage is that the leakage current will dominate and will you know, for large capacity SRAM array. And the 60 SRAM cell is most compact, but then it may have the rate of disturb issue. And lowering the wireline voltage may help, but eventually this is uh, still limited uh, because we cannot turn on many rows in parallel. So to solve this issue, then we have to use ATS run. So this completely decouples the read and write path. Therefore, this offer more flexibility. So Foundry typically offer both 60 and ATS run cell with the Foundry's PDK. And then if we can use that, that is good because if we handcraft the S run cell by manual design, then the density will be two times to four times lower. So here, this is uh, for the S run, and then I will switch the gear to the R run. This is an emerging device technology. So what is R run? This is a resistive random access memory. So you can think this is a two terminal resistor. Actually, it's made of this kind of metal oxide metal stack. So here, this oxide typically is insulating. And then if we apply voltage to the uh, this uh, in top electrode, then we can change the conductance of the cell. So here, this is typical current versus voltage characteristic of the R1. So if we apply large voltage, then the current may jump from the high resonance state to the low resonance state. 
And if we reverse the voltage of clarity, we switch back from high run state to the node, from the node in state to the high run state. So this is like a variable resistor. And we can use the conductance of the device to represent the weight of the network. So the benefit of the R-RAN compared to the S-RAN is that as a same technology node, the R-RAN has much smaller cell size because it just needs one transistor as opposed to six transistor or eight transistor in the S-RAN. And then the R-RAN is more compact, therefore it may hold more number of parameters on chip. If we can hold all the parameters on chip, then we can eliminate the off-chip E-RAN access because D-RAN is expensive in terms of the energy consumption. And then the R-RAN is a volatile memory. That means if you turn off the power supply, the data is still stored in the R-RAN array. That means you can enable the instant on and off. For example, for the edge devices, you can power off the inference engine for a while. And then after you receive the activation signal, then you turn on the inference engine. So you can have an instant on and off capability because the model is stored in the s run already. But s run, oh, sorry, stored in the r run already. But you cannot do that with s run because s run have loaded in the model from somewhere, from your flash memory or download from the cloud. So you cannot do that very frequently if you use s run So here, r is becoming technological mature with foundry availabilities. For example, TSMC is offering commercial RM process, and Intel has their own RM process as well. And there are many other vendors of the RM, for example, the Wenbang, Sony, Panasonic, and so on. So here is, again, a summary table for the silicon implementations with RM-based computing memory designs. And uh, those are the prototype chips reported in the major conferences or the journals. So here, this is a general technology node. And the R run lagging behind the S run. So here, the most advanced demonstration is at 22 nanometer uh, with the TSMC process. And the R run sub array size can be typically larger than the S run. And then it can also support different prestations. And uh, here, one well, challenge of the R run is that the number of rows turned on actually is not that great because the, today's R run technology, the current is too large. Therefore, if we turn on like hundreds of rows, then the quantum current may reach that median level, then this is too large to handle. Therefore, we have to limit the number of rows that turned on continuously. So with the uh, demonstrations, so here are the energy efficiency. I would say this is, again, more normalized to the one bit by one bit Mac. Uh, actually, this number may be lower than the s brand implementation. There are two reasons. One is the number of the rows that turned on simultaneously is less. Second one is the technology load of the R1 is uh, older than the S1. And again, there are more papers uh, using the R1 technology. I will skip the details. I just want to highlight a few designs. Again, this is from the NTHU. Uh, this is a, a one T1 R1 array. And uh, it's implemented in 55 nanometer CMOS process. And this is one megabit array. So here are the design features. Uh, one of that is to scale down the current. As I mentioned earlier, the R1 current may be too large to handle. So what they propose is to have a downscaling uh, wicked current translator at the edge of the array. So if you have the current, Going from the column, then through the current mirror, you can downsize the current before you send that to the ADC. So this can help with the designs. And the next year, the NTHU group published an improved version of the design using a more advanced 22 nanometer process. So in this case, uh, it also supports the negative weight through the two complementary co coding and uh, it demonstrates some of the network with reasonable accuracy. Of course, I would say that from all the prototype chip demonstration, the network uh, inference accuracy is done in a mixed mode. It's not fully on the chip. So because those chips are typically too small, like uh, maybe hundreds of kilobits or megabits, so you cannot 
for the whole model on the chip yet. So what is typically done is the mixed load experiment. So some of the, uh, let's say the, the uh, network layers are implemented on chip with some measurement and then the whole simulation is still done by the software uh, uh, implementation with some hardware measured data. So it's not fully on the chip yet. And uh, this is uh, what we uh, did uh, with uh, Professor Jason Seals group at the Arizona State. So this is uh, through a uh, wind bound technology at 90 nanometer. So this is an R1 array we designed 128 by 64. So here we try to turn on more rows simultaneously. So because previous design only like turn on nine rows at one time. So here we try to turn on 128 rows simultaneously. Because we do that, even though we had older technology load, we can still have higher throughput and better bigger of memory. And that is the energy efficiency much better as a throughput. This is because we turn on multiple more rows at the same time. Some of the design features of this uh, uh, chip is that we use a flash ADC at the edge of the array, and we do this XMO computation in a 2 t 2 class scale. So here we have this uh, truth table for the XMO computation. I will skip the details. This is just to replicate the s functionality in terms of the XMO computation. So here, then we have the edge of the array. So this node is a sensing node. We will use ADC to sense the voltage of this node. And here are some more measurement results. In this design, we also, for the first time, try to program the R run to be multi bit per cell because S run, we can only store one bit in one S run cell. But for the R run, we can program its conductance into multi level states. Therefore, we can store two bit data in one cell. So here we try to program the one cell to be four levels that implement two-bit data, and here this is the programming, after the programming, the distribution of the conductance. And we do see some challenges here. That is the relaxation. So after the programming, the conductance can be very tight, but as time goes by, then the conductance will drift uh, or let's say spread out over time. So this may cause some degradation of the accuracy. Initially it can be good, but the, as the time goes by, then the accuracy may degrade. So this is one of the challenges we have to overcome for the RN technology because the weight is uh, essentially drifting over time. And uh, I will skip some of the details of this implementation. And uh, uh, this is the uh, last uh, chip I want to show. This is our latest result. Uh, we had access to the TSMC 40 nanometer paper to shuttle. So here is the uh, a design with 128 by 128 R1 array with all the peripheral circuits. And uh, here is a diagram of the whole system. Uh, so here, this part is uh, the analog macro, analog box, and then the white boxes are the digital controls. So here we have some new features of this design. I will skip the list, but I just want to highlight a few new features we implemented with this R1 chip. One of the features that is the security, uh, uh, feature that we want to highlight. Because if you imagine that the unit, unit work model are stored in the inference chip and the chip is deployed in the field. So if someone can hack into your memory array and read out all the data from the memory array, so basically he will uh, obtain your weights and he can reconstruct the neural network model or reverse engineer your model. And you know the model is very expensive. You spend like uh, weeks or even months to train that and with your maybe private data set. So it's valuable. So you don't the adversary to hack into the chip and then so, uh, steal your weights. So here the idea is a very straightforward. Let's encrypt the weight on the chip. So here are the very simple in, uh, encryption is through the uh, XOR cipher. So here basically idea is that we split the weight into a complementary pattern. And then with only with the correct key, then we can turn on the uh, appropriate uh, row. So because we have two rows to choose 
and then with the correct key, and then we can turn on the correct row to do the computation. So then the challenge here is that we don't want to apply the key to the memory array directly. That will sacrifice the parallel computation. And, and, and so what we do here is to apply the key to the input. So through this formulation, you can see that if we want to reconstruct the partial sum, then we'll apply the key ideally to the weights, to the encrypted weights. But then we can and, and, and basically derive this equation. We can spell out the XOR function, the so XOR function, and then eventually you can see that the key can be applied to the input instead of the weight. So that means we can add some end gates before the VLAN. Therefore, we can um, do the decoding and, and using this way. So this chip can uh, support this feature and then we we'll analyze some of the uh, random guess attack on the chip. If we randomly guess the key, then for the ResNet, sometimes you can get a little bit better like accuracy because there are some bypass um, uh, 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 from the layers to layers. But if you encrypt um, more layers, then you can kill the accuracy under the attack. And uh, here are the more features of the chip due to the time limit. I will skip the details. So this chip also supports the on-chip verify and on-chip references. So this is uh, to basically make the chip testing more, friend more friendly. So we can enable the faster programming of the RN um, weights. So here is a quick summary of the RN based uh, chips. So generally we have the 1T1 or 2T2 as a bit cell. So it's much smaller than six or eight, eight, eight transistor s run cell. So this is uh, at the same technology load. And RN has a potential for the multi-level cell. So we can store two bit per cell or even three bit per cell. So we can further increase the density of the storage. But it may also suffer from the relaxation and reliability issues, especially at higher temperature. And also, RN face challenges in the high programming voltage and low unstate resistance. So there's still room for the technology improvement to meet the better aspects. So one of the biggest challenges that for the RN, the latest RN technology is available at 22 nanometer low. But you know, the SRAM is already available at the seven nanometer low. So there's a big gap in terms of scaling. So here, if the cost is a concern, then of course, 22 nanometer is a, a sweet spot for the low cost edge platforms. So then the RAM can be a good fit there. But if you want to pursue high performance, then scaling the technology load is still very important. So next, I will talk about some of the challenges that we, from our lessons uh, in those tape out ex experiences. The first challenge for the computing memory is always the ADC. This will take too much area and power budget. So if you look at the breakdown of the power, like 80% of the chip uh, consume the power by the ADC, essentially. So here, then we have to think about how to do the ADC. So there are two, typically two types of ADC available for the computing memory. One is this flash ADC. Essentially, we have multiple comparators with different references. And then we can do the comparison in one cycle, and then we can do the encoding after that. And then the other ADC is the SAR ADC. So in this one, we will do the comparator like sequentially. So we will first, we will dynamically tune the reference with the SAR logic. So this will take longer time, but apparently, you will spend less area and uh, power. So here we did some simulation with the GSMC PDT. So the general guideline is that if the partial sound precision is higher than four bits, then we may have to switch to the SAR ADC, considering the trade-off between the latency and the area and the power. And we discussed briefly earlier, the challenge for the end compute is the variation of the noises. So this may, start, may, may degrade the accuracy of the inference. So here we show some of the programming schemes to tighten the distribution of the resistance of this unbound RN chip. And with more iterations, we can tighten the distribution. Ideally, we want every cell to be exactly the same resistance. 
and that somehow the variations will uh, be unvo unavoidable. So we have to rely on the neural network to tolerate some of the degradations by the hardware. So the like, noise aware training will help if you can make your neural network model, let's say more robust against the noise, then that will help when we later uh, deploy that to the inference engine. So we have to rely on the algorithm and hardware co-design to deal with the variations and noises. And here uh, we just show another non-ideal effect from the circuit level, that is the ADC may have the offset due to the process variation. So this will degrade the inference accuracy. But what we can do here is to do the retraining. So let's say after the chip is fabricated, you deploy the model to the chip, and then you run some inference straightforward uh, uh, path uh, on the chip, and then you get the predicted output and use that as your like, uh, training data set to retrain the network model. Essentially, then the network will be fine-tuned to adapt to the variations of each chip. If we do that after hundreds of iterations, we can recover most of the degradation of the accuracy caused by the offset. So of course, this will add on the cost for the testing phase. You have to calibrate each chip and then fine tune your network model. So this is certainly an overhead in the chip testing. And finally, with the RN technology, there are some device level non-perfect non characteristics. For example, we want the RN resistance to be high and the red voltage to be low. So this is the layout of the chip. Because of the high voltage, we have to use the level shifter to convert the voltage domain from the logic VDD, for example, one volt, to the RN's programming voltage, like three volts. So this take too much area of the chip. So here we did some projection. If we want to improve the device performance, then if we can increase the resistance by 10 times, and if we can reduce the voltage from red voltage from three volts down to one volt, then we can greatly improve the right energy and also the read energy. So there are many rooms for the device engineers to further uh, optimize the device characteristics. And finally, I want to point out some of the future trends. Uh, as we re realize the challenges for the RN technology, the scaling is behind the logic. So why not we design a system using a monolithic 3D integration with two-tier partitioning? So here, the RN array can be at older technology load, for example, 40 nanometer in this case. And then all the peripheral logic can be at more advanced node, for example, 28, 16, or even beyond. Therefore, we can take advantage of the RN normal activity at the back end of the LAN, and then the high performance logic at the front end of the LAN. So this is the general idea. And then we did some evaluation on this uh, with the collaboration from Professor Dan Kulin's group. So here we did a 24 megabit RN tile design and we use a commercial EDA flow to incorporate two PDKs at two different technology nodes. And then we do the partition of the design to two tiers. So here, I just want to show the final layout of the chip. So if we do everything at two, two D baseline, and this is conventional like silicon chips, you only have the one tier. So this is at 40 nanometer load. Then this is the layout of the chip. And then we, what we can do is partition this into two tier. At the top tier with the 40 nanometer PDK, we can have the, let's say the R1. This is a, the to, a top tier. We have the R1 and this uh, closest peripheral circuits like the level shift and the max. And the bottom tier, we can have the logic uh, at more at advanced node. Here we only have 16 nanometer PDK. So we do that at 16 nanometer, but you can imagine to do that at seven nanometer or five nanometer if you have access to that. So here then with this two-tier design, we can shrink the overall area of the chip. And also we can improve the energy efficiency. So here I'll skip the details. The conclusion here is that we can increase the energy efficiency by four times if we do the partition into two tiers. 
And of course, for the 3D circuit design, the thermal is always the concern because you have two tiers. If you cannot dissipate your heat efficiently, then the temperature may rise up. Uh, but we did some thermal simulations and we found out that the temperature increase will be very minimal, uh, typically less than 10 degrees for this RN-based design because RN-based design, the power density actually is not that high. It's unlike your GPU, it's very hot in this kind of edge inference chip, the power density is low, therefore the temperature is not a big concern here. All right, this is a final summary. Uh, as an outlook uh, to the future, I would say that the computing memory is a promising paradigm to save the intermediate data movement between your uh, weight memory and the compute units. Therefore, this can improve the energy efficiency and throughput for the machine learning workload. And computing SRAM is available at the advanced technology load. And this can offer the best energy efficiency and throughput. But if we want to care about the battery lifetime or the edge inference, because most of the edge devices is in the standby mode, then we need to switch to the number of tile memory, that's RN, because it can be powered on and off instantly. And this RN can further increase the density if we can do that multi level per cell. So here, no matter S run or R run, we need to take care of the inference accuracy degradation caused by the end of nature of the compute, either the variations offset or the noises. So we may have to rely on the retraining or the noise aware training. So the R run based design still face challenges as those device characteristics are not perfect yet. But we believe that if we can do the 3D integration for the R run on top, of the CMOS at a hybrid node that can overcome some of the challenges and fully unleash the potentials for the computing memory. And our group also has developed a benchmark framework to evaluate different technologies for the computing memory based accelerators. So this is the open source at this GitHub link. So you can use this code to benchmark different implementations for different kinds of neural networks. This tool is interfaced with PyTorch, so you can um, define your neural network model and then run the hardware implementations uh, to get the estimates on the circuit level performances and also some accuracy degradation and factors due to the noise, due to the variations, and so on. So with this, I'd like to thank my collaborators in the research, including Professor Meng Fan Chang on the SRAM based design, Professor Jason Seal on the RM based design and Professor Sam Kyuling on the modernistic 3D based design. So this research is sponsored by those funding agencies. I'd like to thank their generous support. And with this, I'd like to conclude my talk. I would be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Simon. So thank you for your talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? If you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself. I think there's a question. From the chat, yeah. So I can read out the question and uh, let me try to address that. How can we make SRAM based computing memory adaptive for different applications which require different energy latency and precision? Okay, so I think that's a very good question. This is in regard to the reconfigurability in general for the computing memory approach. So here, most of the demonstrations so far, as we mentioned in the talk, are custom design. And that means they are customized for certain neural network model. If you want to reconfigure the chip for different models, then you need to add some uh, network on chip or router on the chip to redefine the data flow. So this is doable, but most of the designs today, or let's say the silicon chips today, only have like a one macro or a few macro. So 
it's not large enough to do this reconfiguration yet. But in principle, uh, as a system designer, then you can define those data paths through the reconfigurable channels, either through the NLC, or maybe if NLC is too expensive, then you can have some simple router uh, with some reconfiguration bits to redistribute, uh, re redirect the, the data flow for different net networks. So this is doable. Other questions? I think there's another question in the chat box. Yeah, okay, got it. So the question is, does R RAM based CIM have potential energy efficiency advantage over S RAM based CIM? So here you may have seen many papers reporting that like very impressive numbers from the R RAM based uh, approaches. And those are based on very ideal like assumptions about the device characteristics. But if you look at the real implementations, those are available from the boundaries, then the RM based solutions generally has have lower energy efficiency than SRAM. The reason is that the device is not that ideal, especially the unstate resistance of the RMs too low, at least from the commercial foundries uh, offering today. So there are two approaches uh, to further improve that. One is ask a foundry to re-optimize their process uh, because originally the RM development at the foundry is not for this computing memory uh, platform. They use it for embedded lambda uh, memory or like the uh, e-flash replacement. So their engineering target is different. So the first uh, approach is ask foundry to re-engineer the RM process. But this may be quite challenging. And uh, second one is to look for other devices instead of RM. And actually my group recently has done a lot of research in the ferroelectric technologies. So the FEFET technology um, in, uh, naturally offer higher resistance than RM. Therefore, the energy efficiency could be better than the SRAM implementations if we switch to the other technologies like FEFET. So there are two approaches. Either ask a foundry to optimize SRAM, or to optimize RAM, or switch to other uh, emerging technologies. Other questions? Okay, one more question here. Uh, the question is, what do you think is the biggest advantage of the computing memory based on 3D RAM? Uh, 3D RAM, uh, so I, I'm not so sure what 3D RAM you are referring to. You mean like uh, the cross R, like a 3D X point kind of 3D RAM? And like a phase change, if you replace that phase change memory with the RAM, then you have the 3D RAM, or you are talking about that like 3D vertical RAM. So certainly if you do 3D R run, then you have higher density. So density is uh, of course very important here uh, because you want to hold all the data on chip. You don't want to go off chip with the DRAM access. So if you can do the 3D stacking of the R run, then that will be good. But then it won't help with the energy efficiency issue or the challenge we discussed earlier. If you cannot improve the device characteristics if you cannot increase the unstated resistance, then still the energy efficiency won't be more competitive than SRAM. Of course, you can get higher density by 3D stacking. And then one more question. Uh, can we obtain network, network accuracy by circuit simulation tools? How can we know if the circuit design is correct? Okay, so the open source tool I mentioned here, this neural scene, actually can help with the neural network accuracy simulation, considering the hardware non-ideal effects. So for example, we incorporate the device variations and circuit um, uh, non-ideal effects into the simulation. For example, we have the noise 
or if you have limited precision of the ADC, or if you have the weight drift over time. So we can incorporate those non-ideal properties into the neural network simulation and get the accuracy. Uh, so this is, of course, this is, this is like a initial design space exploration tool. It's not the verification tool that you would use for the tape out. For the tape out, then there's no direct way to verify the circuit, uh, neural, network, neural network functionality on the post layout simulation. So no such design automation tool is available right now. So you have to rely on the the other tools to do the verification. So, so this there's no direct answer to your question. How do we directly verify the functionality on the chip? So there's no way because uh, 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 the, for example, the variation and noises are not uh, predictable uh, before you measure the chip. So we have to rely on some other tools to do that. The neural thing can be a good starting point. I got one more question. So, are we running out of time? Or so I can take more questions, right? We don't have the very strict uh, uh, time limit here. Yeah. Okay. Let me take one more question here. Uh, there are many AI generator companies nowadays. According to you, what uh, are there any mature CIM based AI generator chips or companies? Oh, I don't want to comment on this. <laughs> so, so certainly there are many uh, uh, startups uh, uh, working on this area using different technologies. Some of them using that uh, uh, number of memory, including that like, more mature like low flash, and some of them are using like more emerging technologies, maybe RN, and some of them are using like SRN. So, I think uh, 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 I won't comment the individual companies. Uh, I would say that the mature technology of course will enter the market earlier than emerging technologies and uh, 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 mature technology even within mature technology i think if you choose the like a flash no flash versus choosing the extra then your target may be different because a flash not embedded flash they cannot scale beyond like the 28 nanometer so you are at some let's say no cost platforms, you, you, your target is no cost platforms. Then if you do an SRAM, probably you can more advanced um, high performance platforms. So their target may be different. Um, but no matter what, for those computing memory approaches, we have to overcome the challenges such as accuracy degradation. So depending on your application, you, you don't want to use this for your self-driving car for sure. So, <laughs> So, but uh, depending on the ap application, so if you can tolerate a certain degree of the degradation, then this can greatly improve the energy efficiency. And this, there's always a trade-off between the efficiency and the accuracy. Any other questions? By the way, uh, one audience asked that, so whether there's a replay for the talk. So I put the, the, the link for this, the, the entire uh, Ruggers Infusion AI seminar on the chat box. So all the information of the upcoming talk and the, the recorded videos of the previous talk can be found there. And uh, Shimo, if no other audience uh, will ask questions. So I, actually I have one question, so here, uh, in your slides, you mentioned that so some current fabricate chips they can already support like the execution for the REST net on the CIFAR tended set, and in that case, so actually they will use kind of the, the uh, several arrays of the, the no matter RM or the or the SRAM to do that, or just a single array. So as I, I mentioned earlier, so for those uh, demonstrations today, they mm -hmm. actually somehow cheated in some sense. So mm -hmm. mostly they will have like one array or maybe multiple array. So they cannot hold the whole network on chip. 
Mm -hmm. So then they either have to use multiple chips if they want to implement the whole network, or they reuse that chip. Uh, so so you have to rely on some software to do the simulate to do the post processing. You get some partial sound from the chip, and then you add that. Or some chips may not have the neural function, so activation function. So you use software to do that. So I don't see any so implementation that can run the network net fully on chip. It's not there yet in terms okay. of the implementation. But okay. from the architecture, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So from the architecture point of view, then of course you can imagine if you have enough, not, not enough space on the chip, you can have multiple uh, sub array, multiple macros, and then you, you have integrated the controller and the data flow control and timing. And then you, you can imagine you can have the fully integrated solution for that, but it's not demonstrated yet. Okay, because in your slides, I I remember that you said it's uh, some current solution can potentially support the DNA model size like to, to a kind of large value. So I'm very curious about that. So for such potentiality, so it can be unlocked that if we, like just as you mentioned, to contain, to allocate the multiple sub arrays in the single chip and then connect them like together, right? Yes, yes. So, so potentially, if you have not enough space on the chip, mm -hmm. most of the macros mm -hmm. here, due to the risk mm -hmm. of the design, they just uh, use like a very small area, like less than a million square, uh, mm -hmm. just one array or few array. And mm -hmm. so it can only support a very small model, like a kilobyte or okay. hundred bytes. Uh, but if you want to for larger model, you have to allocate more arrays, and then you have to have a higher level, like a scheduling and the controller also embedded. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. So so the, the control is not there yet. So most of the implementation, the control is by the software. So you get some may or may, oh, okay. may or some results from the chip, and then you do some post processing, and then the generate the accuracy. It's a, like a mixed, okay. mixed hardware and software like the experiments. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but the, potentially you can do that because the chip area, uh, imagine for example, like a GPU, you have hundreds of millimeters square. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you use the same like, space, then you, you can yeah. have many of those. GPU, you have hundreds, thousands of cores, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so it's just a matter of integration and uh, manpower and uh, budget mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. so, you know. Yeah. yeah, and another small question. So here you mentioned that you use like the SAR ADC to, to uh, the ADC solutions. I was wondering why you choose that one because we have the different types of the ADC, right? So why SAR is kind of preferable choice here? So here we compare the IDC and uh, the flash ADC. Uh, so this is typically, those are typically good for like a median, low to median precision. And oh. but the, 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 so here the ADC requirement is very unique actually for the computing memory. Uh, it does not need very high bandwidth. Uh, so let me find the, the, so here. It does not need very high bandwidth or super high resolution. So typically three to six bit or maybe at most eight bit and then less than one gigabps good enough. So the engineering target is very different from the like, uh, traditional ADC design for the oh. like, uh, analog, uh, um, mixed signal data converter. So here there is a stringent requirement on the ADC area. This is different from oh. the uh, conventional uh, design because in most of the like, uh, maybe the front end uh, like, uh, AD, uh, data converter, right? You only have one ADC or a few ADC in there yeah. for your signal. But here you need many ADC to ideally end of each column, you should have one uh -huh. ADC. Yeah. So the column pitch is very tight. If it's a R run, especially R run, you have one transistor, one resistor. So the column pitch can be very small. So you cannot have one ADC, one column. So in reality, we have to share the ADC between multiple columns through these marks. So this will reduce the parallelism. Because ideally, you can do all fully parallel. This is a promise by the computing memory. But in reality, yeah. you cannot do that in fully parallel. You have to do time multiplexing. 
do it sequentially. Okay. So here, of course, you can reduce the area of the ADC, and then that will help. So if you compare this, of course, then the side you say the area only have like one uh, comparator, and then you have a star logic. Yes. Um, no matter what precision, so you trade off the space with the time. So you can wait for longer time, but then you, you, you can reduce the area. Otherwise, for the flash ADC, this will be exponential growth in terms of the- Yeah, yeah, precision. yeah. So, so that's a trade off. The very stringent okay. requirement on the area for the ADC here. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any other questions from the audience? So, if no more other questions, so let's thank our speaker again. So, thank you, Shimo. Very excellent talk. I learned a lot. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your host. Okay, also, also thank everyone to attend our this week's seminar talk and uh, see you next week. Bye, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.